standards. And um, we had talked about uh, some basics of the uh, Japanese and the European standards, which are um, very widely used um, internationally. Um, so um, when we closed on uh, Monday, excuse me, Tuesday, the, um, we, we had gone through the, um, the basics of the um, European normalization schemes for uh, steels. And, um, and now we come to the, the, the US uh, normalization um, of steel grades. As I had uh, told you earlier, in, um, in the US, um, the impact of <coughs> professional engineering societies yes, on uh, standardizations of materials in general, and steel in particular, is very large. So um, it's, it's a bit different from situation in, for instance, Japan or Europe, where um, government agencies uh, have a big impact also to uh, homogenize the approach. So you, you won't find this in the uh, American standards. And depending on you know, whether if you become an engineer uh, in, a, in a company, uh, depending on the clients you have, uh, they will be uh, ordering uh, steels. Uh, if they do this uh, using American standards, they will use different standards uh, depending on the application. Hmm? Let's have a look. Uh, but there is um, uh, uh, American Iron and Steel Institute, yes, which is um, uh, which has standards which are widely used across many industries to specify uh, steel grades, and they are very closely tied with the Society of Automotive Engineers. Yes, automotive industry is a very big uh, user of of steel products, so. Um, it makes sense uh, that um, they uh, streamlined their approach to uh, normalization. So they basically use um, a very simple scheme with um, four uh, numerical symbols, yes, um, or uh, alphanumeric symbols, four or five. So and they always look like uh, X, X, Y, Y, or X, X, Y, 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 um, because these digits refer to something different, okay? That's why, um, so, so the first digits are a reference um, to the major alloying elements, yes? And so they define the various types of, of steels. You have basically three types, hmm? uh, uh, plain carbon, carbon manganese steels, two more hardenable grades, which contain substantial alloying elements. So say for, take, for instance, uh, carbon steels uh, with uh, less than uh, 1.65 manganese, uh, 0.6 silicon, and 0.6 copper will look like this. They will all start with an 1, X, Y, Y. Okay? So plain carbon steels yes, of, of this type here, right? Uh, one X, Y, Y are divided in subclasses. So one zero, the zero means that you have a low manganese content, less than 1%. If it's a one instead of a zero, it, it doesn't mean anything in relation to the manganese. It just means that it's resulfurized. It contains 0.1% of sulfur. If it's got 0.2, yes, it means that it's resulfurized and it also has rephosphorized. It's got a higher phosphorus content to make them easily more, uh, more machinable. If it's got a three, then we're back to a specification related to manganese. It means that the uh, manganese range goes from 1.6 to 1.9% of manganese. And if it goes to five, you would think it would re be related to higher percentage of manganese. So, and it doesn't, it's, it's from 1 to 1.6 percent. So, there is no logic, no, not necessarily logic in the, in the numbering, okay, in, in this numbering. So, it's a little bit frustrating 
um, uh, and, and you usually have to go back through uh, you know, the tables to find out what specifically is referred to. So that's a little bit um, uh, frustrating. Okay, and so the last, luckily the last two uh, uh, digits, uh, or three digits, YY or YYY, define the approximate carbon concentration um, times 100. So, for instance, an XX number, number 40 means approximately 0.4% of uh, carbon. And if you have XX100, yes, so number, number 100 means approximately 1% of carbon. Hmm? So, and then, so we c you can basically divide uh, your steels into low carbon steels, medium carbon steels, and high carbon steels. Hmm? So, um, low carbon less than 0.2%, 0.2 to 0.5 are uh, medium carbon steel and high carbon steels are more than half a percent. That is, a, in, in US and North America, is very, very common way of referring to steels, low carbon, medium carbon, or engineering steel and high carbon. So it's kind of good to remember that, what, what people mean when they say high carbon in the US means more than half a percent. It doesn't mean one percent. It could be one percent, but it's, it, you know, it could be as low as a half a percent, okay? Um, and then, um, the, uh, uh, if a steel contains important alloying elements, yes, there is an extra letter inserted between second and third digit. Hmm? So sometimes you have uh, five symbols, but one of them is not necessarily a number. If it's a B, for instance, it means that it's a boron added uh, steel. Hmm? Uh, if it contains lead, yes, um, L. Yes, instead of a P, which you would expect from, uh, for the chemical symbol, it's L. Yes. So that um, um, is also indicated. All right. Oops, the other direction. So um, quite a um, uh, challenge to, um, to find your way in, these, in this numbering. Yes. So obviously, I don't expect you to, um, to learn this, but... Um, I, I, I do provide you with some starting knowledge in the, uh, about these, uh, this, the approach uh, used by AISI SAE standards. Uh, so first of all, so the way you have to look at it, the way it's, it's, it's structured, hmm? so the, the, the general, the material steels are divided in uh, uh, low alloy steels, yes, and high alloy steels. When we meet alloy steels, we don't, there's nothing about the carbon, yes? Alloying means adding chromium, moly, so it doesn't say anything about the carbon. Hmm? So what are high alloy steels? What are high alloy steels in uh, ASIA uh, 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 standards? That's usually, that means corrosion resistance. Chromium, high chromium, high nickel steels. Uh, basically stainless steels, okay? So, 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 so let's just focus on what we say, we call low alloy steels. They are divided in these three big groups, low carbon, less than 0.2, medium carbon, 0.2 to 0.6, and a high carbon, 0.6 to, uh, 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 this, uh, there's a few uh, typos, uh, uh, so this should be 0.5 and then 0.5. Six uh, higher than 0.5, um, yeah. So if you could change this to 0.5, maybe uh, then you know that up to 0.5, it's a medium carbon steel, and then from over there, it's um, we call it high carbon steels. Okay, and so in each case, yes, you have a plain carbon version. Yes? Yes? That's just a steel where the main alloying element is carbon. Yes? And, and so because they're not alloyed, they all, all the numbers, so there are no alloying additions. Yes? It doesn't mean that there are no specifications about the levels of certain elements. Yes? But in principle, it's, you don't make alloying additions. Yeah? Well, we'll see when we talk about steel making, usually you have to, even if you make a very 
simple grade, you need to uh, uh, have the right composition for all the elements that are specified in the center. So, so in, you may very well have added some manganese just to get the right uh, uh, levels. Yeah? But, but in principle, it's, it's not an, an addition <coughs> to achieve anything peculiar, uh, specific. So it starts, they all start with 1, 0, because there, there's no alloying additions. Yeah? Okay? And then the other, the other number that's of importance is the two last digits. So this means 0.1% of carbon, 0.4% of carbon, 0.95% of carbon. Yeah? Okay? And of course, you can have this, this type of steels where you do alloy. Yeah? Where you do alloy. For instance, at HSLA steels, you add micro-alloying additions. Yes? So, um, different number. Yes? Okay. I, I, it's just to make you feel good, I don't know. I, I, uh, I know a few numbers, you know, because they're common. Yeah? But this one, I, I would, you know, you would tell me, ask me what it is I, you know, precisely. I wouldn't be able to tell you. I would have to look it up, right? Uh, but anyway, so this uh, uh, is, for instance, microalloy. Uh, this group here is very important. This these are all the engineering steels, yes? So they usually start with a 4 or a 5 or 6 or 8 numbers, yes? So I know that when I see this, it's an engineering steel, yes? So it will be heat treated, usually used in the uh, uh, quenched and tempered state, yes? And, and, and the highly alloyed steels, same thing, lots of, lots of carbon and, lots, and, and alloying additions, okay? So why would you do this? For instance, if I make martensite here, it's going to be much softer martensite than in this case. So that would be, for instance, one of the reasons that you would do this. And you can see this in the applications, yes? Here, for instance, these kind of things will be used for, to make, for instance, pressure vessel steels, yes? Here, we'll make uh, parts, for instance, that go into construction of motors, pistons, gears, other wear resistance part in machineries. It's the kind of steels, yes. And here, drills, tools, saw, dies, etc. Hmm? Okay. So, um, right, and, and see, here you have a number of. Uh, uh, I, I, so this list is, is put together. Um, these are very common um, AIS, um, AISI uh, uh, grades. Yes, these these grades are very common, hmm? and you can see. So the, the two top ones are plain carbon steels, no alloying. So they start with one zero. As soon as you get the one here, you probably remember that means that you've added sulfur. Yes, so it's a resulfurized steels. The five here means it's manganese added, okay? okay? As soon as you don't have this one anymore, you know you're into alloyed, alloyed grades. Yes? Alloyed, uh, excuse me, uh, alloyed grades and higher carbon. Hmm? So for instance, this one is a uh, uh, well-known um, uh, grade name for steels that we make ball bearings with. Ball bearings are uh, often made with this. This is a very well, uh, often used engineering steel. So, so are these, anyway, these are uh, pretty uh, important. So you can see here that um, if I look at this carefully, hmm, I can see, for instance, that five, five, I look at the composition, yes, um, of the, the, so the important alloying elements, is, 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 uh, as you know, are uh, chrome, moly, nickel, etc. Uh, you can see here that uh, with the 5-1, yeah, 5 1, I, have, I only have chrome, yes? So the, the 5000 series usually refers to steels where the only addition is chromium, yes? And you can see that uh, in this case, for instance, the 8620, I have nickel. I have added chrome and I have added molybdenum. Hmm? So these numbers will refer to uh, the uh, 
the, uh, more complex alloying additions. Hmm? Let's have a, a look here. Okay, so, uh, so, so, so here I know it's a plain carbon seal because of this, this one here, right? Same here. Here I have the one on the, the second place, so um, resulfurized. Here I have a five on the second place, high manganese steels. These numbers here, 41, 43, 51, 52, I, you know, there's no logic to it, but these numbers refer to the type of alloy steels. Is it chrome alloyed, chrome nickel moly alloyed, is it nickel alloyed? Yes? So if you want to add this, you can do this. And, uh, and this is the actual list. Yes, so if, if, you, if you want to know the, uh, you know, what for instance, 88 means, okay, you can see it's a nickel chrome moly alloy, okay? And you see typical levels, yes? But if it's a five, five, it's only chromium, yes? Now I want you to look at your table, yes? And there are some typos. Uh, so the 5OXX is, is mistyped. There's, there's nickel something something. <coughs> so if you go on the line chromium steels, 5OXX, it says something with nickel, I think, if you look carefully. Yeah? And there's another one that uh, I think that 52, uh, this should, it should be this. It's, uh, high chrome and, and, and high carbon, yeah. Okay. And sometimes, I, you know, I, I do have to say things can be quite confusing. Um, for instance, you would think that um, the nickel, um, the, the, or originally, the, the, the silicon steels, the high silicon steels, would be all with 90s, yes? But you actually have nickel chrome molybdenum steels that also start with the same numbers. Why is that? Well, because with this approach, you, r you quickly run out of numbers. Right? So, so it's not a, uh, a very... Um, uh, logical uh, thing, but um, if, if, if you know vaguely how it works, you can, um, you can identify the grades. And, uh, but you, for specific grades, you will have to go back to the, uh, either the table like this, or of course, uh, by the actual standards. <laughs> okay. Okay, so in the US, there was also, uh, is something that's called the uh, universal numbering system. And uh, that's basically uh, all, the, all materials have a number. Uh, basically, well, it's a, a digit, one digit followed by one uh, letter, excuse me, followed by a five digit number, yes? So anytime there is a steel, yes, a new steel being developed, it gets a number, right? So the number itself doesn't make much sense. You know, it doesn't say anything, it's just a number. You, new steel comes in, new n number, okay? Uh, there is a little bit of a subdivision in the numbering, yes? And that's in the letter. No? So G, S, T, D, H. So G stands for just it's a plain carbon steel or it's an alloy steel. S, if it's specifically for heat or corrosion application, resistant application. T for tool steels. D for specific mechanical properties, usually meaning drawing, drawing applications. And H for um, hardenable steels. Hmm? Uh, this system is, is uh, very rarely used. It's, you know, you, um, some people use it. It's, uh, it, it's even more um, 
you know, mysterious what the number means because, it, you know, the numbers are just given to uh, steel as, as they are being developed, yes? So um, it's not very uh, much use, but you should know about it, that um, if you ever come across it, it's the universal uh, numbering system um, number, yeah? Now, having said this, um, in, uh, in North America, the, um, you have AISI, yes, but you have a lot of other professional organizations that have uh, their own specifications. So uh, AISI itself has um, designations for stainless steels, yes? which takes into account the uh, ferritic stainless steels, austenitic stainless steels, martensitic stainless steel, uh, precipitation hardened stainless steels, yes? And that does not refer, the, the numbers there also don't refer to the composition or the carbon level, yes? So that's, um, for instance, 304, yes, is a, we call them a 300 series stainless steel, yes? And any stainless steel that start that is uh, the 300 series austenitic, yes? If it's ferritic, it's a 400 number, yes? And sometimes these numbers are followed by letters, such as L, which L doesn't mean lead in this case. In this case, it means low for low carbon. So the 304 is a very, very common uh, 18, 18, 10, 18 chrome, 10% nickel, austenitic stainless steels, and it, uh, the L means it has a reduced, a low carbon content um, uh, to provide adequate weldability or formability properties depending on the situation, okay? So that is that also very widely used uh, uh, across the world. Yeah? So even, even uh, the GIST standards use this numbering system. So if you see uh, stainless steels with uh, you know, 400, you know it's a ferritic. If it's, uh, for, a, for instance, a 439 is a ferritic stainless steel. A 321, you know it's an austenitic steel. It may be obviously a special one, but it's an austenitic steel. Right, uh, you, I'm sure you've heard about ASTM. Hmm? ASTM is a, uh, uh, so stands for uh, uh, American Society for Testing and Materials, yes? So in the, in the name itself, it, it says testing and materials. So very often these um, specifications, yes, will, uh, will, you will have, in the specification you'll have steel specifications and testing methods for these steels, yes? That's why ASTM test methods, test procedures are, are very widely used, yes? Because they allow engineers to do the same tests, you know, in China, Japan, according to the same rules, right? So we can compare our data, yeah? Uh, and, it's, and it also defines the grades, yes? And so that means there is an application element to the, the test and the grade. Yeah? So, so we have ASTM classification where the focus is on steel, the, the type of steel product application. Yes? You will have information about composition and properties. Hmm? And very often you can recognize these grades because they are uh, preceded, it's a number preceded by the letter A, yes? So, for instance, for structural steels, yeah, you will have A36. A36, very common structural steel. So that means some you know, steel you make buildings with. Yeah? If it's for ships, A131. Uh, for bridges, A709. There's no logic. Don't look for logic in the numbers, okay? But if you come across a, a grade that you, you, you know, doesn't look like a European specific uh, grade name, it doesn't look like uh, SAE 
uh, grade name, but it starts with a good chance that it's an ASTM specification. And so you'd think that would be enough for Americans to deal with, but you know, as there are many other societies that bring out their own specification for steels. Yeah? For instance, the American Association of I have to read it myself, uh, state highway and transportation officials, they have specifications for steels in bridge construction. Yeah. The ASME is a very important engineering society when it comes to ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, uh, for pressure vessels. Pressure vessel steel. Uh, America is a, as a uh, American engineering has a big impact on uh, petroleum and gas uh, technology. So uh, this is a very important society when it comes to pressure vessel, piping steels, etc. Hmm? API, yes, also related to petroleum and gas industry, but there to the uh, the, the the tubing, yes, mm -hmm. the line pipes and the offshore platforms. They uh, is a society which has a lot of standards in this. Yes, so there are specification for line pipes are usually according to uh, the American Petroleum Institute. Yeah? Um, Amer AMS is for aerospace. Hmm? Aerospace. Um, applic material, aerospace material specifications, yes? And the military is also a huge consumer of uh, equipment, yes? And um, obviously the equipment is according to specifications. Um, uh, and those ones you can recognize when, because it says mill, they start with mill. Yeah? So you know it's a military uh, grade steel, for instance. For instance, when a, uh, the military makes uh, orders um, vehicles for troops in the battlefield, uh, they uh, usually uh, have uh, plates to protect the, um, against explosions. Yes? So the steels that are used like this are not just, just any steel. You know, they're very well specified steels according to uh, these military uh, specifications. Right, and, um, and then perhaps I just want to finish, but I'm not going to talk about it. There are also ISO. ISO is, is an international body um, of um, standardization, International Standardization Office, yes. Um, and they also have uh, standardized many, many things, not only steels, but they have um, standardized um, steel um, <laughs> grades. Uh, and they're basically based on the, chem on the composition of the steels. Mm -hmm. They consider uh, base steels, unalloyed steels, alloyed steels, Unalloyed special steels. Um, you can read this. Um, you will very rarely come across these specif these uh, these specifications. Yes. So I, I usually skip it uh, because uh, it's it's not uh, used. But it's it's really important for you to uh, to know about these uh, uh, the Japanese and the North American and the uh, European specifications because they really you come across them um, very often and everywhere. Um, right, when you are an engineer in a plant, yes, um, and you have to do something according to specification, your company should buy the, the specification, the standards, yes? You should not read an article and say, well, here it says that uh, uh, AISI 439 should have this much titanium, yes? So that's not, okay, you, uh, specifications, you have to buy them. Your company has to own them, yes? Because if there is ever a problem, 
Yeah, it turns out you don't even know the specifications or own them. Uh, you know, that's not very professional. So usually you buy these things. Yeah? You, don't, um, you don't steal them from internet or you don't copy them from somebody else. Um, so they cost um, some money, of course, but your company should, you know, should have this. It's part of a quality um, aspects of um, steel making. Yeah? You should own um, the standards. It's very easy to buy via internet. Yeah, so don't. Uh... Right. So again, um, so I, I hope I've uh, been able to to show you that uh, standards can be useful. Yes. Um, and uh, also show you that there's a, a lot of uh, impact of professional engineering societies and, and trade association and government into these, uh, the steel standards. So, um, you know, the physical metallurgy is sometimes very hard to, to you know, to find, but um, it's there behind uh, it. Yeah. And the, the reason why we use this is because it's, for, for reasons of quality, reliability, and also interchangeability. And interchangeability in today's uh, very large international trade is extremely important, right? And the standards are not just about chemical compositions, right? They'll, they'll also go into uh, properties, yes, mechanical properties, dimensions, yes, dimensions. Um, and uh, I want to... Uh, uh, close by saying that even though we have uh, standards, yes, um, it's very well possible that uh, in your professional activities you will be making steels not according to AISI or ASTM or some European, but according to the specification of your client. So sometimes large consumers of steel such as um, big car makers, Toyota, GM, you have to make their steel, yes, according to their specifications, yes? Okay, so you also have th this, this kind of uh, situations, yeah? All right, so that was for the standards and now I uh, will we will um, continue with some um, few more basics related to uh, products. Where is it? Uh -huh. Uh, there we go. We will uh, now have to say a few words about uh, steel making. Um, we have a GIFT uh, lectures lots of them, on, uh, on steel making. Hmm? And um, the, uh, the thing with these uh, courses is, of course, they, you know, they deal with steel making and um, uh, the blast furnace and slags, and etc. cetera. Um, uh, very often, not necessarily in connection with products. Uh, but uh, so in this case, I'm not giving this type of uh, introduction. What I will be 
focusing on is a few technological things you should know to understand um, the further processing of the steels, yes? Um, and some things that are really important for specific products. So it's a very uh, light introduction to iron and steel making essentials. So we're just going to review the essentials. Yeah? Um, and so we'll uh, look at the Black's furnace, we'll look at the electric arc furnace. That's where our, our iron comes from, basically. So you have some uh, understanding of the liquid part of the uh, manufacturing process. Hmm? And the impact of this liquid part uh, of the processing on the microstructure and uh, composition of the steels. Yeah? Um, it's also important to know uh, that uh, this liquid part has, has a big impact, yes? Because that's basically where you make your chemistry. Yes, that's where you, you know, when we talk about chemistry and composition, that's where it's made, yes, in the liquid part. And as soon as you cast the steel, there's no more going back. Yes, there's no more going back. So it's kind of interesting to know a few things about um, how this alloying is being done, basically. So we'll, we'll, we'll say a few words about this. Uh, and um, I'll... I'll um, I'll, I'll try to, to uh, convey uh, the idea that steel making is not something simple, yes? And um, you know, getting the composition right of a steel is, you know, is, is not done in a simple way. You know, it, it, uh, it takes some effort, yes, uh, to, uh, to get the right chemistries. And um, it's important for you to know this because, you know, if you work in, the, in engineering in, for instance, a um, a, uh, in a bar mill, for instance, you know, you may not be aware of uh, defects that you see that are caused um, by the liquid part of the, the process. Okay, so let's, um, let's start. So what, what we're basically going to talk about, yes, is the this here, yes, in the, in the uh, flow of um, material flow to make uh, products in steel plants, we, s we start with steel making, yeah? Could, uh, so, and, uh, and before that, uh, the electric arc furnace or the blast furnace, yes, and then the continuous casting or the ingot casting. And then the material gets, is in the solid state and then uh, gets processed to, to different uh, products. Okay, so let's, let's have a look here and uh, say a few words about the, uh, the ways we make uh, our steels. Well, usually we start, we, uh, we either start with a blast furnace or a variety, a variant on the blast furnace. Hmm? Um, but by and large, uh, most steel makers um, make st um, iron from ore using the blast furnace. And so in the blast furnace, what do we do? We, um, it's a big um, reactor. And on the top, we load iron ore, coke and limestone. These are ba the basic things. Yeah? And uh, at the bottom, yes, we uh, get out molten iron and molten slag. Uh, the molten iron is so iron, not steel, right? Not steel. Um, the, malt, the, uh, the slag contains or should contain all the, what we call impurities. So what else happens here? Well, the, this uh, big reactor is... Uh, operating at high temperatures, so there is a lining inside that's refractory lining, yes? And um, inside, we um, have charged this, uh, the iron ore, the coke, and the limestone in layers, yes? In layers, so we alternate coke layers with um, uh, iron ore, yes? And um, in order to 
uh, get the reaction uh, of um, uh, iron uh, reduction, iron oxide reduction going, we blow in air, heated air, yes, at the bottom here via these, uh, this, this big pipe here that uh, has connections to the, the furnace via tubes, yeah, which we call two airs. Okay, um, some details here. First of all, what we load is not usually uh, uh, it's not usually coal. It's, it's coal that has been treated, metallurgical coal that has been turned into coke. So it's hard and it has uh, uh, mechanical properties. So it doesn't collapse uh, and it doesn't contain gaseous compounds. Okay? The same with the iron ore. Iron ore, uh, it's, we don't use, you know, iron uh, or as such, very little of it, we center the iron ore usually. So again, so we have a very strong uh, 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 lumps of uh, material, yes, um, with the right permeability, yes, and uh, the right strength, you know, so it doesn't collapse on, at high heat, you know, and, the high, and the correct dimensions. So the, the, the flow of gas is uh, good through the uh, blast furnace. Hmm? And uh, with the heated air here, uh, we can also inject coal powder hmm, to uh, decrease the amount of coke we add at the top here. So what happens? Hmm? We generate heat in this uh, converter, basically, this um, reactor, excuse me, by one exothermic reaction, which is burning of um, carbon, C plus O is CO2. So this, is, this um, uh, reactor here produces a lot of CO2. Yeah. And then uh, we reduce the oxide to metal. Mm? And we, we use for the reduction of um, uh, this, the oxide, we use CO gas, which is made in the, um, in the, uh, in the furnace. And we use carbon, yes? And, and, and these are the reactions here. Hmm? Fe2O3 going to uh, iron, and then Fe2O3 being reduced in steps to iron um, by carbon. All these reactions are endothermic. They pick up heat. You need, you need heat for that, OK? So um, you absolutely need coal combustions to make the blast furnace work. Hmm? There's other important reactions that happen is purifications. All our, the ore material we add contains not only our iron oxide, but also silica, alumina, yes, et cetera. They, they, we need to separate this from our uh, metal, and we do this with, by adding lime. Uh, hmm? Lime is basically calcium oxide, yes? And uh, the calcium oxide reacts with silica and alumina to form a liquid slag. And it's, it's uh, an oxide, yes? And so it has a very low density compared to the iron, so it floats on top, and we can uh, uh, remove them. We can separate the two phases. Hmm? All right, um, some, some little detail here. Some numbers first. 9,000 tons per day. Uh, uh, modern um, blast furnace produce 9,000 tons. That means 2.5 million tons of iron per year, yes? Uh, blast furnaces operate around the clock, every day, for many, many years. Yeah. 10 years, 15 years, depending on the wear of the lining, yes? On the inside. Um, where does the ore come from? Yes. Well, uh, iron can be uh, mined many places. Yes. Uh, but most of our iron ore comes from high iron oxide content minerals. Yes. And so they come from uh, mainly uh, uh, countries like uh, Australia, Brazil. Yes. Which have very high they have ores with very high iron contents. Yeah? Uh, 
And one of the uh, minerals is, are, are these uh, banded iron formations, yes? Which, uh, this is what the mineral looks like. You can see the iron oxide, this is the red layers, yes? And uh, this is where uh, they uh, are made. So they were very, uh, made billions of years ago. Um, originally, we did not have on Earth um, oxygen, yes? And um, the oceans contain a lot of iron, yes? Which in, was dissolved, and there's no uh, oxygen in the air. However, when we started getting uh, living organisms, would change ox uh, 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 CO2 into oxygen, yes? Suddenly, we had, due to uh, photosynthesis, we started to having oxygen in the water. Yeah? And, uh, and this was then transformed, uh, this oxygen in the water reacted with the uh, iron, yes, and just formed deposits of uh, hematite and magnetite. Yeah? And because they're deposited in water, they form these layers, and they alternate with silica-rich layers. So there's always intimately mixed with, with other minerals. Yeah? That's the reason why you need these slags to remove these other oxides um, that uh, you don't need to have in the steel. Hmm? But be, uh, so, uh, this is important here because minerals that are in the ore will also be reduced to a certain level. Yes? So uh, there will always be some silicon in your steels uh, because that's in the ore. The same thing, uh, there will always be some manganese in your steel because it's very often associated with iron in your iron ores. Yes? Okay. Now, the steel that, uh, excuse me, the iron that's been made, yes, contains high levels of carbon, high levels of phosphorus, and high levels of sulfur. Now, carbon in itself, we don't mind. We've seen uh, when we talked about standards that you, know, you need carbon for many steels to achieve strength. Um, but in a, uh, in a uh, uh, blast furnace, uh, iron, yes, the levels are very high, you know, 4%. Yes. So you can't really use this material because it's basically a cast iron. Yes? It's very brittle. So you need to remove the uh, carbon, the sulfur, and the phosphorus. The sulfur and the phosphorus because they are very strong and brittling agents. Yes? And the levels of sulfur and phosphor are too high for most applications, so we remove them. So how does this work? So you do this in a, uh, the desulfurization to start with, you do this in a pretreatment. So the material that comes out of the blast furnace is desulfurized, and the decarburization and dephosphorization is done in the uh, converter. And the uh, this is usually called the BOF converter, basic oxygen furnace, BOF. Right, so uh, BOF is basically a reactor, yes, a reactor where you put in the, uh, the iron. Hmm? This iron will contain about 4% of carbon. After the treatment in the BOF, it will be 100 to 500 ppm of carbon. So it's a huge reduction of uh, the carbon content. How is this re uh, reduced, this level? By blowing oxygen on the surface of your iron and by injecting gas through the bottom of this um, uh, BOF. Again, um, all this carbon is turned into CO2, so you produce a lot of CO2, and this 
uh, production of CO2 is a very exothermic reaction. So um, you will need to have uh, a uh, uh, refractory brick-lined converter. Hmm? And usually that is magnesia brick lining, which contains a little bit of carbon. It has mechanical stability and chemical stability is also important. Uh, uh, chemical stability uh, towards the liquid metal, but also chemical stability towards the slag that you form. Hmm? Okay, let's add a few numbers about the converter. Typically, 150 to 350 tons of metal can be, uh, 350 is a very large one, uh, 150 is on the smaller side, but typical sizes are 250, you know, 250, 275. That's what you usually see, that's an industry standard. Tap to tap time, that means the time it takes to make 250 tons of steel is between 20 and 25 minutes. So it's a very high rate of production. How long do you blow typically? Well, of these 20 to 25 minutes, about 15 minutes are spent blowing. Hmm? Blowing meaning carrying out the decarburization. Hmm? So what you do is you, uh, you have oxygen top blowing, yes, and you have bottom stirring. Bottom stirring means you inject gas in the bottom, and the, usually the, this gas is oxygen and argon. Hmm? The, the oxygen will just do the decarburization, and the argon is used to stir up the bath, yes? And this is very important. No alloying additions. The BOF is not an alloying. You don't do any alloying. If anything, you remove a lot of, uh, a lot of elements, not only, not, uh, uh, not only carbon. To so say here an example, we come in not only with high carbon, but also with high silicon, 0.8 silicon, almost 1% of silicon, half a percent of manganese, 600 ppm of sulfur, 350 ppm of carbon. Yes? So the temperature that you have by the time you go from the blast furnace into the uh, uh, basic oxygen furnace, the BUF, is about um, 1450 degrees. That's much lower than the uh, solidification temperature of iron, right, which is close to 1600, right? So uh, you've noticed that there's no added heat in this. Yes? There's enough heat produced by the uh, burning of the carbon. Hmm? So so this is what you have in terms of the steel coming out. You have 500 to 800 ppm of carbon. Yeah? Okay, that's important that you remember this number. Okay, 500, yes. You have about 0.01% of silicon. So that's, you have about 0.15% of manganese. Yeah? So even an unalloyed Low carbon steel will always have at least 0.15% of manganese, yes? Not 0% of manganese, yes? Um, sulfur, 350, so about half of this, and phosphorus uh, is reduced to about 100 ppm. Remember that number? That is typically the lowest level you can get in terms of phosphorus, yes? The phosphorus is actually removed effectively in the blast, in the BOF, yes? And that's kind of level that you can get, yeah? Um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in the regular steel. Uh, in addition to this, you have about 40 ppm of nitrogen, uh, usually uh, low uh, hydrogen or no hydrogen, and low residuals is low residuals. When steelmakers talk about residuals, they they they, they mean things like antimony, tin, uh, bismuth, copper. Uh, 
and the temperature is a staggering 1700 degrees C. So it's very hot. The reaction uh, is very hot. Yeah? Um, the slag that you get out is a slag with very high CaO content and also very high FeO content. Yes? This is very typical of a uh, BOF slag. So it's a very, we call it very high basicity slag. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we have this is because it's here underneath is the is to ensure that you remove as much phosphorus as possible. Mm -hmm. To have a, for those who have taken uh, 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 steel uh, metallurgy courses, this the slag has to be oxidizing and have a high basicity. You need to oxidize the phosphorus and uh, be able to trap the phosphorus in the slag. Um, SiO2 is in the slag. Uh, uh, MgO is in the slag. The MgO in the slag is from the lime, yeah, from the, the lime that we use to, to make the slag. Um, if you ever uh, work in a or visit uh, a steel plant, there are many vi variants of the process. Yes, um, most of the modern uh, uh, BOFs combine top blowing, yes, and bottom blowing technologies. Yes, and you have what we call combined blowing. So most of the uh, uh, BOFs nowadays look like this. You have both uh, a combined uh, nitrogen, argon, or, nit or uh, oxygen and argon bottom blowing and a top blowing of oxygen. Good. So what happens during these, uh, the, 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 uh, the blowing? Hmm? Yeah. Uh, the steel composition changes. Yes. The temperature increases. And the, the, and the composition of the slag changes. So let's have a look here at the carbon, silicon, and phosphorus content of the uh, steel. So this is for the steel. So what we see is that the carbon level decreases. Yes. The, the silicon level decreases very quickly, yes? So silicon removal is very easy in the BOF. Carbon is also very easy. You do have a lot more carbon, so it takes a longer time, yes? The phosphorus initially decreases a little bit, then it stays flat, yes? Until, yes, you see at this stage here, about three-fourths through the process, the amount of carbon in the steel has dropped considerably. And you start oxidizing the iron, yes? This iron oxide goes into the slag, yes? And this makes it possible for the slag to absorb P2O5, phosphorus oxide, yes? And that's where you start decreasing the phosphorus level, yes? So uh, this, the FeO content in the slag is necessary for an efficient phosphorus removal. And of course, it results in some loss of iron to the slag. Hmm? In the meanwhile, the temperature has gone from 1300 and something or 1400 to way over 1600, right? So very high temperatures. Okay, we have other techniques to make um, uh, steels, yes, and that's basically by melting old steel, yeah, and that's the, that technology is electric arc furnaces. Yeah? Electric arc furnace technologies are usually associated with smaller steel companies, yes. So um, companies like POSCO, Nippon Steel, ArcelorMittal are big companies. They make 
50, 40, 50 million tons of steel, 100, close to 100 million tons of steel per year. Most of their material, most of the steel they make is new steel. New steel, yes. They, um, they use ore to make iron, pig iron, and then turn it into steel. Many companies use old steel, recycled steel. They recycle steel and they use electric arc furnace to make steel. So we have so steel making from recycled scrap steel. We have the electric arc furnace, where you basically melt uh, scrap metal, yes, and 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 you already make chemical composition when you do this, yes, something you don't do in the BUF, okay? Right, and there are usually two steps. You have an electric arc furnace where you melt a scrap metal, you add ferro alloys and other additions, and in the second step, you adjust the composition, okay, which may involve um, oxygen uh, also. So let's have a look at this um, electric arc furnace. There are many different technologies, but nowadays you have what we call low-cost, high-performance electric arc furnaces, and these are the, the, um, the specifics of these uh, electric arc furnaces. So diameters are about, they're, they're a circular um, furnaces, about eight, four to eight meters of diameter. The, 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 the weight that of, of steel, hmm, is 50, typically in the range of 50 to 150. Nowadays, industry is at about 120. Yeah? 150 is on the uh, larger size, 125. The electric power, yes, is with typically uh, 125 mega volt amperes transformers, and we use alternating current. Um, so there's a big difference here between making new steel and using scrap. When you make new steel, you make a lot of CO2, yes? You become a major source of CO2. When you use an electric arc furnace, all the heating comes from the electricity, yes? So you don't emit CO2, hmm? okay? So there's an environmental impact to the use of electric arc furnaces. Hmm? Uh, there are, however, also burners. Usually there are uh, some uh, gas burners, natural gas burners are used. Um, you use a foaming slag, a, sp a special slag that foams, yes, basically by uh, injecting a mixture of carbon and oxygen into the, the, the slag. You um, have about 30 heats a day with a um, uh, electric arc furnace. So the production is about 3,600 tons per day. Yes. And the tap to tap time is about uh, 50 minutes. Hmm? So, um, so a, an electric arc furnace will produce Every 50 minutes will produce 120 tons of steel. A BOF produces 250 tons every half an hour, yes? So it's a big difference, yes? So you produce a lot more steel in a BOF situation than in a, with an electric arc furnace, okay? Okay. So, um, uh, so this is what it looks like. You, you basically have these electrodes here that um, uh, make an arc with the steel surface and that basically melts the, the metal. Uh, and then you have a, a slag on top of the steel again. You can separate them both, yes? Nowadays, um, we, when you take, pour the steel, you pour it from below via an ex, it was called an ET, extra, uh, eccentric bottom tapping, yes, um, and so you can easily separate the, uh, the steel from the slag, yeah, because you don't want to have slag inclusions in your steel. That's very, very bad, okay. 
Okay, so here are some numbers here, and then I'll close. Um, what, what are the typical inputs in an electric arc furnace? Well, these uh, electrodes are made from graphite, so they do burn, yes, in uh, the atmosphere. Um, we uh, have scrap metal goes into the uh, electric arc furnace, lime or dolomite. Uh, uh, lime is uh, CaO, and dolomite is a mixture of CaO and MgO. Hmm? That will form the slag. We can, uh, as I said, make a foaming slag. We'll need to uh, inject oxygen and carbon, and then we do the tapping. So what do we get? We put in about 1,000 um, uh, 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 kilos of scrap here, yes? Uh, we, we put more than a thousand, of course, but this is just referring to a ton, right? Yeah. So y what you get out is basically what you put in, yes? You, you put in uh, about a ton of, uh, of uh, scrap, you get out a ton of steel. Yeah? Uh, you use about a few kilograms of electrode, uh, about 30 kilos of lime, about 20, 25 kilos of oxygen, natural gas, coal, and refractories, and this is what you get out. Um, for every ton of uh, uh, steel, you get about 100 kilos of, of slag. All right. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll finish here. Thank you for your attention, and um, we'll meet on